The topic of my talk is going to be uh, Navier-Stokes equations. These are a set of equations that are very, very famous to mathematicians, but we don't really understand them. So much so that there's a million dollar prize if you are able to help us understand them more. So my idea in this talk is to strip back these equations, layer by layer, uh, pun very much intended, as you'll see, um, and explain uh, what the equations are about, where they come from, how we build them, and maybe even how you might get your hands on those million dollars. So that's the rough outline, and I'll try and whisk through that in 10 minutes. Uh, so the first thing then, the first layer, what do the equations actually model? Um, so Navier-Stokes equations describe the behavior of every fluid on Earth, which is quite a claim. And when I say fluid here, we define a fluid to be something that changes shape to fit the container that it is in. So air, or any other gas, would be modeled as a fluid and would satisfy the Navier-Stokes equations. So any liquid and gas will definitely satisfy these equations and some other weird and wonderful things as well. Um, so I've got some examples. Um, this one is from my PhD. Uh, so here we've got uh, the Connecticut River flowing off the coast of the US, off the east coast. And as you can see, the river is filled with sand and silt. And as it flows into the water, it is very clearly being turned to the right and then flowing along the coast. And this behavior is explained by, by the Navier-Stokes equations. And I was studying this phenomena for my PhD. Uh, so I did some experiments in a lab. So here's my river coming into my rotating ocean. And as you'll see, it will now turn to the side and then flow along the coast. And this is a real experiment. This is not a simulation. This is actual, you know, get my hands dirty doing experiments. So rivers, oceans, pollution, all that stuff, natural phenomena. It's all going to be to do with Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, here is a heart beating and pumping blood around the body. It is, in fact, my heart. Um, which is quite scary, having an ultrasound scan of your own heart and seeing your heart beating on a screen, like where you're right next to it, next to the screen. Uh, so I volunteered to be a guinea pig to, to have this done and talk about the experience for a radio show. Uh, but I thought it's a really nice example here of a, uh, a biological situation where you have a fluid flowing around the body, blood. And for example, if you want to make better drugs, you understand more about the fluid flow so that you can design drugs that reach where they need to be in the body faster, more efficient, et cetera. So again, sort of like medical applications to the Navier-Stokes equations and fluid mechanics. And a third and final example, um, this shows you how aerodynamic a T-Rex is. <laughs> um, so here you've got a T-Rex, you've got wind blowing in the face of the T-Rex, and this is showing you the uh, velocity field behind the T-Rex. Uh, obviously, the T-Rex is quite a silly example. It's just there for fun. But if you replace the T-Rex with, let's say, a uh, fighter jet or a car or a Formula One race car, aerodynamics, it's all to do with fluid mechanics and solving the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and as I said, if you're not convinced that these are great yet, you do get a million dollars if you're able to improve our understanding of these equations. That is the wording of the problem. It's very vague as to what you have to do, and I'll talk about at the end what I think you have to do. But just a word of warning, if you manage to win the million dollars, do not do uh, as Peter does in this little clip. The, um, the best bit about that clip, as well as being quite funny, so I'm glad you laughed, is that if you were to model the individual coins, you would model it like a fluid, and it would behave like a fluid. So uh, <laughs> it's appropriate in many ways. Um, right, so layer two then. Um, what is actually in these equations? Like, what do we expect to be in the equations, thinking about all of these situations to do with fluids that we're trying to understand and we're trying to model? So we've got various experiments, uh, videos to show you. So this is a uh, bottle of water, has a hole in the bottom, and what's going to happen when we press play is the water shoots out the hole, but you'll see that the layer, the level of the water is dropping because the water is leaving. So what is changing here is the water pressure. So the fluid, the water is leaving the bottle because of the pressure. But as the pressure changes, the behavior of the fluid changes. So if we're going to write down a set of equations to describe how fluids behave, there's going to be pressure in those equations, because clearly it has an effect on the, on the behavior of a fluid. Um, 
Another experiment here. So what we've got um, is now uh, a tank filled with water. On the top, you have um, you know, this salt water, which is clear. And on the bottom layer, you have fresh water, which is dyed green. And there's a metal barrier separating them. So when you remove the barrier, the heavy water on the top will sink, and the light water on the bottom will rise. And you get this incredible thing which happens. It's possibly the most beautiful experiment I've ever seen. Uh, this is one of my colleagues, uh, Megan davis Wikes at Cambridge did this for her PhD. Um, and it's actually like a piece of art. Um, but what's going on here is the density difference in those two layers of fluid is causing this movement. Because if you do the exact same experiment where you have fresh water on top, fresh water on the bottom, and you pull out the barrier, absolutely nothing happens. So the difference in the density is creating motion, create, causing the fluid to behave in a certain way. So we expect density to be an important part of the Navier-Stokes equations. And then final experiment. So what we have here is a uh, circular beaker, which is filled with a very thick, sticky sugar syrup. And we've got three drops of food coloring, yellow, red, blue. And what we're going to do is stir this around. Um, I'm going to say, let's call it anti-clockwise first. And then after, say, do like five rotations, stop, and then go backwards. OK, so now, before I play the video, think what would happen if this was water with three drops of color in, and then you stirred it around and stirred it back. But what we've done in this video and in this experiment is instead of using water, we've changed and used this thick, sticky sugar fluid which has a much higher viscosity. So we've changed a particular property of the fluid, which is viscosity, and we get these results. So as you can see, <coughs> we get a very, very different behavior by changing the viscosity of the fluid. That would not happen with water. All right, stripping back to our third layer, as you may have realized. Um, <laughs> where do these equations come from? So we know the things they model. We know a bit about the variables and the forces and things that should be in the equations. So let's try and construct them mathematically and see what they look like. So we start with conservation of mass. It's a very, I'm going to say, universal law of physics. If you have a blob of fluid here, and then it moves with some velocity, and it's maybe changed shape a bit, but I have not added anything and I have not taken away anything, I have the same amount of fluid, the same mass of fluid. The mass of the fluid hasn't changed. Nothing's added, nothing's been taken away. It's moved around a bit and it's deformed, but its mass is unchanged. So if you accept that as sensible, which hopefully seems to be pretty sensible, um, then you mathematically say, this is a formula here for your mass. We want the mass to not change the rate of change of mass with time is zero, and you get this fancy formula. It doesn't actually matter what that formula is. I'm not going to try and explain it properly. It just tells you that the mass of a fluid is conserved. Simple, hopefully, as I say, universal law of physics. And then the second Navier-Stokes equation is going to come from momentum. So when I say the word momentum, if you've studied physics at high school level, you're probably thinking of a particular scientist goes by the name of Isaac Newton. Momentum. Rate of change of momentum is equal to force, also known as F equals MA, or mass times acceleration is the sum of your forces. Newton's second law. It's, again, a very universal law that just kind of works in almost every situation. Um, now, if we figure out what's going on here, mass is just going to be density times an acceleration. So that's the left-hand side of Newton's equation. And then for the forces, we go back to everything we looked at in the second layer with our experiments. We had pressure, and there's your pressure term. And then we had viscosity, the thickness of the fluid, which is that term. And then there are other things like gravity or rotation or electromagnetism. And we kind of cheat here and just call them external forces and stick it on the end. But the second Navier-Stokes equation, which looks even worse than the first, this is scary. As a mathematician, to me, this is scary. This is the hard one. 
but it's actually just Newton's second law. Force is mass times acceleration for a fluid. Um, and here is a full derivation done in 30 seconds to the music of Benny Hill. So, stripping back to our final layer of the Navier-Stokes <laughs> equations. And, and there, is, there is, I should point out at this point, that the Navier-Stokes equations are these <laughs> written, tattooed on my side here, the two equations. Um, so, stripping back to the fourth layer then, I promised I would talk to you about how I think you can win the million dollars. So, hopefully now you've got at least a little bit of a feel for what these equations are, where they come from. So the first way that I think you're going to get this, how you're going to improve our understanding, is when it comes to something called turbulence. So turbulence is just incredibly random motion. Something that's so random, you can't even begin to predict or understand what's happening with it. And that's like a problem, because fluids, imagine two waves crashing into each other. As those water particles interact, you have literally no idea what's going on there. It's just completely random, like, mess of interactions. So this is another experiment demonstrating this. So I've got here two blobs of fluid. We've got red and green. This is just a tank filled with water. It's all rotating. And then I've gone like this on the surface of the water to create this random motion. And now I'm going to press play, but in your head, sort of picture where you think this die is going to go. All right, and then watch what happens. So whatever you were picturing, it probably isn't this. And I did this experiment, I think, about 100 times. And every time, I got a completely different pattern, despite putting in the same amount of dye and everything else, keeping everything that's almost as similar as I could. And you just get this incredible, incredible randomness. It's chaos, is what we call it, something that you can't model. And so we don't understand turbulence. If you come up with a model to explain all of this, you'll get the million dollars. Um, and then the second one, probably not much easier, is um, Something called a singularity um, in maths. So a singularity is when you divide by zero. Uh, the physics equivalent would be a black hole. Um, so you know, we don't really understand black holes that well. So you can probably guess we don't really understand singularities mathematically very well. And I've got a little uh, final experimental video showing you uh, an example of a singularity. So here you've got two bits of circular wire, and they've been dipped in, a so in soap. So they're forming this soap bubble between the two circles. And as you slowly move them apart, you're going to see the soap bubble change slowly. And then suddenly, it's going to burst. OK, so the two rings should be slowly moving apart. So the volume of that bubble starts to slowly change, slowly change, slowly change, and it pops. And that corresponds to an infinite change. You're going from a very, very slow movement to zero. So it's changing infinitely fast. And that is an example of a kind of a singularity, which in the equations just doesn't work. But as we can clearly see, it does happen with fluids. So again, if you're able to understand singularities, you probably get a million dollars as well. Um, and finally, the fifth and final layer <laughs> is if anyone can present me the solution, I will stand here completely naked. <laughs> um, I've done this a few times, even to like university level um, uh, students and, and postdocs and whatnot, and no one has been brave enough to try and present the solution. So hopefully I'm safe. Um, so uh, yes, that is the end of my talk. Um, I think we can do questions, but thank you very much. <laughs>